in uh, services as they can. Thank you, Dr. Langdon. Okay, if everyone's ready. It is our pleasure today to welcome Dr. Denise Klein, our distinguished speaker this year, leading off our series on educational neuroscience. Dr. Klein has worked within the cognitive neuroscience field uh, in Montreal, in the Montreal Institute for Neuroscience, MIN, and is also a professor there in the Department of Neurology and Neurosurgery at McGill University. She arrived there at the Montreal uh, Neurological Institute as a distinguished fellow working there with Brenda Miller, Dr. Brenda Miller, Milner. And has since that time been working with neuroimaging technology in investigation of language processing. Dr. Klein is one of the earliest scientists to begin using neuroimaging technologies to investigate language experience, how language experience shifts processing. Her research has prompted a great deal of discussion on how the brain is organized and has medical translational uh, impacts for those preparing to undergo neurological surgeries that she will speak to in today's presentation. Thank you and welcome. So thank you very much for inviting me here today. It's a great honor and privilege. Uh, from Laura. I'm really pleased to be here to speak with you today and I really enjoyed my time with all the students, uh, really engaging and interesting questions that they were asking and I really enjoyed their enthusiasm for the field. So today I'm going to be talking to you about how language experience shapes the brain and uh, there's beautiful work that comes out of this institution looking at similar questions, but I'm going to focus on my own work because that's what I feel most comfortable speaking about. Uh, but I hope you'll see how the fields or how the questions that we're asking address similar questions and how we might arrive at a body of knowledge at the end of this all uh, that might inform uh, uh, the field. Um, so I'm just... Uh, I'm going to be speaking today, all of our work looks at the developed brain to see what's happened in infancy. So by that I'm not studying children, I'm studying adults or adolescents uh, whose brains are fully developed in some sense and we're looking at how their language learning experiences uh, during early life shaped later adult organisation. And I'm going to be speaking about three um, uh, types of scenarios today uh, that uh, we've been studying. So the first is uh, bilingual language processing and uh, here I'm going to focus on the work that we've been doing in Montreal where we've been looking at English French bilinguals and capitalizing on the different language learning experiences that people have there uh, in order uh, to address uh, how the brain is shaped for one language, learning two languages from birth one language and then another language later in life and being able to manipulate age of acquisition effects and uh, proficiency measures. The second line of research that I'm going to focus on today is the work that I've been doing with Rachel Mabry where uh, in the first case scenario that I'm going to be talking about you're looking at what happens when a language is learned from birth in life and then either two languages from birth or a language uh, overlaid on an already developed linguistic system. Uh, with the work with Rachel, I'm going to look at the question of what happens when you learn a language, uh, a mother tongue that varies in the age of acquisition. So what happens when your first language uh, is, is uh, learned from birth, but what happens when if you learn that first language at later uh, ages in development? So how is the first language impacted by age of acquisition? <coughs> 
And in the third scenario, I'm going to focus on work that we've been doing that's actually uh, hot off the press with uh, Fred Genesee and Laura Pierce, where we've been looking at international adoptees because they provide another natural language learning environment in which you can look at what happens when you learn a language. It's abruptly lost and you have a second first language. So I'm going to be taking these three lines of evidence and trying to draw together some conclusions for you. So I'm going to start, because I'm interested in the brain, with some work that Alan Evans uh, has been doing where he's been looking at anatomical MRIs and he looks at the uh, volume of brain growth and he looks at the rate of brain growth. And what I wanted to point out in the slide is that what you can see in this uh, bottom line over here is that by four months, uh, uh, four years of age, the brain is kind of fully formed. But actually, if you can look in the further slide over there, you can see that it's actually the three months and six months that have the most rapid rate of growth. And that after that, if you look um, in the 12 month and 24 month period, and certainly in the last year, uh, this rate really drops off. So the, um, I think what his work is showing on an anatomical level is really how rapidly uh, the brain is growing and uh, sort of neural connections are being made in those very early phases of life. And uh, I'm going to go to discuss um, models that people have put out there about sensitive area, uh, periods for ac ac language acquisition and we all sort of have know that there are these ideas put out there about sensitive periods for first language acquisition that in general the first three years of life are really critical that that's kind of one uh, critical period that there might be another one between the ages of about three and seven or eight and then that there's another sort of uh, element of development through to the end of puberty. And most people have sort of talked about these periods as all being sort of optimal or critical periods for the development of language. Um, and this applies not only to a sensitive period for first acquisition, but also uh, people have put out uh, a philosophy about sensitive periods for second language acquisition as well, following similar kind of time course, similar type of time course uh, uh, of the first sort of three or four years has been quite important, uh, then slowly dropping off around the age of adolescence has been harder to acquire uh, a second language. Uh, and I'm going to use uh, functional brain imaging tools uh, together, um, uh, so functional MRI, I'm going to show you our work that we've been doing in imaging that gives you sort of a window into how we uh, can understand how these early experiences with language uh, are shaping the brain. Um, so it's not, you may not know that it's actually quite recent that we've been able to sort of look inside the human brain. When I first came to the neuro in 1992 to work with Dr. Milner, uh, what she's really well known for is neuropsychology, a development of a field which was developed in order to develop behavioral tasks to kind of get a window into what was happening in the brain. So in patients with different types of brain lesions where they couldn't tell where the lesion was, she developed these cognitive tasks to try and tease apart where patients did well or did poorly and to correlate that with resection of those brain regions. Well, now we have this possibility of viewing inside the human brain uh, without brain lesions. And when I came in 1992, the field was ripe to start developing uh, this interesting uh, possibilities for understanding what was happening in the healthy living brain. So I'm going to take you through a bit of a history of that in our study of bilingual brain organization. So the first half of my study looks at studies we've been doing in Montreal with English-French bilinguals. And uh, what I really was interested in when I came to the neuro was uh, brain organization for first and second languages. And I was interested in the question, are the same brain regions involved for first and second languages? How are two languages represented in the brain? And um, the work follows on from some seminal work that was happening just shortly before I arrived at the neuro, where the first PET scans, positron emission tomography scans, were coming out in the work of Peterson and Rakel's lab in St. Louis. And they were showing for the first time that you could develop tasks that uh, subjects could do in the scanner and that you could selectively map out if you designed careful experimental tasks areas of the brain that were exclusive for seeing words, hearing words, speaking words, or for generating words. 
And when I got to the neuro, I thought, oh, well, it could be interesting to see, do these same regions exist when you're looking at second language speakers? So the first study that I designed was a PET scan. Um, so it doesn't seem to be moving. Okay, the first task I designed was a PET scan. And PET scans were kind of interesting because you had the subject doing basically how a PET scan worked is a person was lying in a scanner, they had an IV line inserted into the arm, through it you administered a water bolus, so it's called oxygen 15, but it's basically a water molecule that when you injected it, it increased glucose metabolism to whichever part of the brain was working harder, showed an increase in activation. And you designed the task so that there was a control task and there was an experimental task. And the idea was that you would subtract those two kinds of tasks to see brain areas that were specific to one region or to one task but not another. So in this task we had English-French volunteers. So English was their mother tongue. Uh, French was their second language. They all learned French after the age of about four or five. Uh, in Montreal, four is kind of a, a critical period because they all start going to kindergarten around grade four and learning words. So um, we, we took them, uh, anybody who'd been exposed after the age of four, but all learning French in their second language environment. And how we designed it very similar to the Peterson task, but including uh, stimuli in the first and second language. So they either repeated words in English, contestant, contestant. They generated synonyms in English, so they heard beverage and they came up with the word drink or weep and cry. They generated rhymes, so tactical and practical. And some of the things we were kind of interested in were getting at very specific kinds of searches, so rhymes are quite specific, whereas synonyms are quite global. You can sometimes find more than one word. Then we were interested in across language translations, so forget, oublier. And then we did it in the second language, so in the same idea. We didn't do rhymes in the second language because that's quite difficult. And we, what you can do here is you can subtract. So you can subtract repeating words from generating synonyms. So the auditory input is subtracted out because they hear words in both. The speech output is subtracted out because they speak in both. And what you hear are the, uh, what you see are the regions that are specifically active for the search process. And you can also subtract synonyms in English from synonyms in French or you can uh, look at translation compared to um, uh, synonym generation and in this way you can tease out what's happening uh, in each of the conditions. And for this specific experiment the input was always auditory so they were listening to the words and the output was always speech. And what we found was really quite striking. It's not often that you can take an image like this at exactly the same cut. And what you could see here is really very strongly, so firstly in these images the left hemisphere is always on the left side of the brain and just for people who are non-imaging uh, people it's called an axial slice, a sagittal slice and a coronal slice and so the left hemisphere is on the left and what you can see, so firstly very unilateral left hemisphere activation for generating. Uh, then what you can see in this first condition is generating synonyms in the second condition is generating rhymes, and in the third condition is an across-language translation. So strikingly similar patterns for these three tasks, irrespective of whether the search was based on meaning, phonology, or an across-language search. Now I'm not going to talk about the peak that's different in the last condition. I'm going to come back to it, but remember it. There's one additional peak in the left basal ganglia that I'm going to come back to in a minute. But what you can see here, if you subtracted one from the other, is these frontal lobe peaks essentially disappear. Sort of suggesting that this area in the left frontal lobe is a more general lexical search and retrieval area rather than being more specific to one aspect of language processing. And if we looked to just the generation of synonyms in the L1 or the L2, you see the activity is strikingly similar in the left frontal lobe. They look slightly different because of the, um, the main area where the uh, significant peak is. But if you subtract these two out, the frontal lobe activity disappears. 
And we then uh, decided that, well, maybe English and French are quite similar, and these people are hearing English and French in their everyday lives. So let's look at people who speak languages that are more distinct. So let's look at Mandarin and English with this pattern exist in English and Mandarin. And also maybe four years is quite early for people to be learning a second language. So let's look at people who acquire their L2 much later in life. So we got university students from McGill who were all Mandarin first language. This time English is the second language. And we got them to do the same task that the Peterson study did, so noun verb generation. We didn't use synonyms because actually Mandarin is a very tight language and there aren't synonyms in Mandarin. They have no two words which actually, um, they don't mess around with sort of flimsy use of language. So words are really precise. So you don't get two words that actually carry similar meaning. So we did the noun verb generation because we knew that we activated a similar region that Peterson had activated. So here we did a similar task. They repeated words in Mandarin or they generated verbs in Mandarin. So again, the auditory input is controlled for and the speech output is controlled for, but what you're looking at is the area involved in, in generally in retrieval. And we did this in the L1, which was Mandarin, and in the L2, which was uh, uh, English. And what we saw was strikingly similar patterns of activation again in the two languages, very strongly left lateralized, and when you subtract the two from each other, the frontal lobe peaks disappear, suggesting that these areas of activation are there for languages learned early, languages learned late, um, irrespective of the proficiency and uh, irrespective of whether the languages are distinct or whether they are quite similar. And then around the same time, Laura Petito and her student were doing a, a study where they used, again, PET scans. And this time they did a similar kind of a study, but they did it with signing. And uh, so they had repeating signs and generating verbs for noun signs. And again, really strikingly similar patterns of activation. So here they showed in deaf signers speaking American Sign Language and in deaf signers speaking Quebec Sign Language, again, these left frontal activations. Uh, they compared them with hearing individuals doing a similar kind of a task, hearing English and hearing French, and again, similar patterns of brain activation, showing strikingly similar concordance irrespective of whether the retrieval was within or across modalities, uh, really suggesting that this left frontal region is an important region for search and retrieval uh, across uh, all languages, all levels of proficiency. It's a more general area for search and retrieval, and it kind of makes sense in a way about language users. We all have quite a large ability to develop vocabularies or to develop skill sets like these in many languages that we learn, and even as late learners of a language, we are able to become... All right, sorry. We are able to become quite proficient uh, at these skills. But what I'm going to show you is that there's one area of activity in this uh, pattern of activity that we saw very early in our work, which shows activity in the left basal ganglia. So you can see in that last condition, what is distinct to that condition is that they are producing the response into their non-native language. So in all these other conditions, they are speaking in their mother tongue when they're generating the synonym in R1, when they're generating the rhyme, but when they're translating, they're hearing the word in English and they're producing the response into French. And if you actually subtract L1 synonym from L2 synonym, the frontal lobe peak disappears, and what you see is the peak in the left basal ganglia. Now, we've done many studies since this, replicating this finding. We've looked at just repeating words in a second language minus repeating words in a first, and the area of difference between the two languages is in the left basal ganglia. And we hypothesized that this was related to the increased articulatory demands in producing the response in the less automated language. Uh, and um, there's quite a lot of evidence that this might be true. One of them actually comes from a, a disorder called foreign accent syndrome, which is a very rare disorder which happens after a stroke. So this is a newspaper article which said, Scots woman wakes up speaking with a South African accent. And it says, a Scottish woman with a lilting brogue went to bed with a headache and spoke up spe uh, woke up speaking with a South African accent, a British doctor said. Doctors say the woman had a stroke and is now suffering from foreign accent syndrome, 
a rare condition in which patients acquire a completely different accent after suffering a stroke. It is to do with the melody or intonation of one's voice. Uh, normally, a stroke victim's voice is affecting, affected in terms of slowing it down or finding it difficult to speak. And I've seen some interviews with some of these patients, and I kind of find it interesting because in a lot of them, they report that they found this psychologically very disconcerting. And in some way, I think that accent is linked to many different things, including our identity. And identity is formed from very early in life, and I think that some of the reasons why we might find it more difficult to change our accent is that part of changing your accent also requires a changing of identity. And I've been in Canada for more years than I was actually in South Africa, and I still have a very strong accent. So I think in some way, it probably is what defines us and what is quite difficult to change. But aside from that, this area of the brain seems to be really difficult uh, or really um, difficult to change later in life. Um, so one of the studies that we've been doing is we've been looking at intensive language training uh, and we've been looking at participants after 12 weeks of intensive language training. So they go into, um, it's actually uh, five days a week, six hours a day and uh, we scan them within the first week of their training and then we scan them after they've finished the 12 weeks of training. Now this is ongoing work, it's really not scientific what I'm going to show you, but I thought I'd put it in just so you could kind of see some of the stuff that we're trying to get at here, and which I sort of found was a bit intriguing. So we have been measuring their speech samples. We've been getting speech samples. So besides them reporting that they're actually sounding better, they are producing, if you can see here, the, um, the complex sentences and compound sentences, which are the purple and the yellow, the proportion is about 15% at time one versus about 50% uh, at time two. So they really are starting to produce much more complex sentences. And we've been looking at vowel plots of how their vowels change over the 12 weeks of training. So what's interesting is we, we plotted a native speaker with their vowel sounds. We see that the vowel sounds of the participants do change from time one to time two. They don't actually approximate the native speakers. Um, but the reality is also that if you look at their bold signal change, it's actually reducing in the basal ganglia after 12 weeks of training. So now we still have been looking, and a lot of students have been asking me today about what reduction in activity means and what thickness of the brain means. And I'm going to say that they're, they're quite a difficult thing to disentangle because we've also been looking at voxel-based morphometry measurements in these subjects. And I'm not pre presenting data here, but one of my students has found that you get more uh, gray matter density in the putamen in better producers, better accented speech. Um, so in the basal ganglia, I think the density is actually related probably to better performance, but this is something that we're still going to be teasing apart. And uh, some of the things that we've been looking at also about brain structure has been related to cortical thickness. So all that I've been telling you up until now has been about brain function. But a lot of people, there's a lot of literature out there which is showing that not only do our brains change in function over time, but that our brains can actually change their shape. And so I'm going to talk to you, with all these scans that we were doing, we decided to do a retrospective study of the MRIs of the subjects that we'd been looking at. So we didn't have that much data on them because we didn't set it up very well from the beginning. But we did look at their MRIs. And we had a group of 68, which is quite a large sample size. And they were matched for handedness and education and SES and their chronological age. And we divided them into simultaneous bilinguals, so those that learned uh, before the age of three, early bilinguals that learned between the ages of four and seven, and late bilinguals after the age of eight years. And we did this cortical thickness measurement study. And basically, cortical thickness measurement is quite complicated. But what you're really looking at is the measurement of the difference between the purple and the red. So that uh, part of the cortex, the, the measure of the distance between the peel surface and its boundary. So you, you kind of do an analysis where you uh, make vertices in the brain, and it's a whole brain analysis, and you uh, calculate. Uh, this calculation is in each of these tiny vertices and you compare the two groups to each other, and you find an area of statistical difference in cortical thickness 
between the groups. As an example here, it gets highlighted by the, the colored peak. And what you can look at then is comparisons between groups. So this is a whole brain cortical thickness analysis where we compared bilinguals, all our bilinguals, against a monolingual group. And what we found is that the bilinguals had a thicker left frontal cortex compared to the monolinguals. But actually, when you start dividing out the data, what you find is that the late bilingual group is actually the ones which are driving the difference. So the late bilinguals compared to the monolinguals show a thick left frontal cortex. When you look at the early bilinguals, so that's between the ages of four and seven, they have a little bit of thickness, but not quite as much. And when you look at simultaneous bilinguals compared to monolinguals, there's no cortical thickness difference. And at first we were kind of a bit stumbled by that. We didn't know what that meant. But I actually think it kind of makes sense. And I'm starting to think about the brain as kind of um, setting up a room. And when you set up a room from the beginning, and there's nothing in the room. You can choose exactly how you want to set it up. And so when you make those little holes to put all your cords in, you know, for all the different things that you're going to set up, if you're doing it for one language or if you're doing it for two languages, when you're doing it from birth, the brain kind of goes with the flow and it's got these areas that are naturally meant for that processing, and so it sets it up all very efficiently. But if you wire up the room and then if, you know, a few months later you suddenly decide, oh, you'd really like to add something extra to it, right? the hole might not be quite big enough or you might haven't put it in exactly the same place, so then you've got to kind of add things to it. And so what we did then is we looked at the regression just in the late bilingual, and what we found that it's actually the, the later that you're learning the... Uh, so this, in this regression, the later that you're learning your second language, the thicker your left frontal cortex. So I think that the frontal lobe probably thins like it naturally it does, it prunes as we become proficient users of a language. And then if we learn the second one, we kind of have to bulk up a little bit. Like in the juggling study, where our motor cortices probably thin as we become more developed. And then when you learn juggling, yes, your motor cortex has to bulk up a little bit because you're sort of learning a new skill that you have to add to it. What's interesting here is we saw at the same time as the, th the earlier you learn it, the thinner your left frontal cortex, or the later you learn it, the thicker your, your uh, cortex. In the uh, homologous right frontal lobe, the earlier the age of acquisition, the thicker the right frontal cortex. And uh, now not a lot has been looked at in terms of a lot, there's a lot of literature out there. There was a big meta-analysis by Vade and Hull, and uh, I know that your group have uh, spoken about uh, the interhemispheric sort of connectivity. I don't think that we've, a lot of us have looked at the interplay between the two hemispheres, and I think this is quite an interesting question. One of the things that we can't tell from this data is how the two hemispheres are working together, even though there's something intriguing going on here. And um, I think in the right frontal cortex, maybe it gets thicker because the right frontal lobe has many different roles to play. It's not dedicated to language per se. And when you add on sort of the pragmatic role or something related to language that you have to use, to, uh, maybe that there are additional thicking that takes place over a lifetime of using two languages involved in that aspect of processing. One thing that we've kind of currently been doing, but it's really very preliminary, is we've been looking at resting state connectivity. And in this very preliminary slide, so it's not significant, I'm just telling you we just seeded a group of simultaneous bilinguals in the left frontal cortex. The only significant dif uh, difference or the only significant connectivity that we saw was between the left and right homologous brokers regions. Um, in the simultaneous bilinguals, but not in the late, suggesting again that early language sets up this interaction between the two hemispheres um, more than it does in, in late acquisition. So in this little part of the story that I've been talking about, I've been talking about bilingualism and how our brains kind of come to be set up for one or two languages. Um, obviously, when you study function, depending on the task that you use, you can find areas of the brain that are more similar for processing some aspects of language. If you look at articulation, you might find areas that are more different for the two languages or that require more recruitment. Um, when you look at cortical thickness or some measures like that, you might be looking at age of acquisition effects. So other ways of exploring what's happening are to capitalize on other early language experiences that happen. 
such as delayed acquisition of a first language to get at questions about how the brain might come to be set up or organized for language. So in this study, I had the opportunity of working with Rachel Maybury, who'd been working with congenitally deaf individuals um, who vary in the age in which they acquire sign language. And this picture is just meant to depict varying years of age. Um, but the work uh, focuses on, um, or it, it extends the work that Rachel Mabry had been doing, looking at grammatical judgment tasks. And what she had shown is that when you learn to sign early or when you learn to speak early, you show similar patterns uh, for grammatical judgment. Uh, so that early spoken language and early sign language show similar relationship to each other. But late learners of sign have a lot of difficulty with grammatical judgments. And we then took the same subjects and we imaged their brains doing a grammaticality judgment task. And what we found, so we divided 24 subjects into native, that is between 0 and 3, early, between 4 and 7, and late, after the age of 7, uh, signing. So this is not a second language, this is their first language. And what we saw, I'm just going to show you here that there's an image of the brain which shows where the activity is in relation to the blue is the left frontal region and the red is the uh, uh, left occipital region. And what you see is an inverse relationship. So the first two groups show an increased bold signal in this left broker-like region that I've been talking about. So actually the natives activate both hemispheres, but left hemisphere also more extensively. The early somewhat, um, but the late actually show an inverse pattern. So they're showing a reduction of bold signal in the left broker-like region and an increase in bold signal in uh, visual cortex. So they're processing the late sign as a processing these uh, items in terms of the visual structure rather than the semantics. And this ties in with the work that Rachel had been doing with these individuals where she'd showed that native signers tend to make more semantic types of errors, whereas late signers tend to make more visual types of errors. And um, so the, the work fits in quite nicely with that. And when we do a regression, so this is we lumped everybody together and we looked at age of acquisition and a whole brain analysis, we saw that the percent bold signal change correlates with age of acquisition and that the earlier that you acquire sign language, the more likely you are to activate this left broker-like region. And the later you acquire sign language, the more likely you are to, acquire, uh, to activate the left visual cortex. Now, a student of ours afterwards did some anatomical studies on these and she found a voxel-based morphometry thickness with the late signers having thicker gray matter density in the visual cortex. Um, so we're still sort of looking at what the, the anatomical work on this means, and we've got DTI, diffusion tensor imaging data on these same subjects. Um, we, we have to still finish analyzing all the results, but there are both functional and structural changes at areas that you predict. Um, and strikingly, again, this area in the left frontal lobe coming up as being important for early acquisition of language. And in the absence of learning language early, this frontal lobe region seems to become important for other aspects of processing. So basically, if you don't learn language within that first phase of life, that area that's dedicated or meant to be for language uh, subserves other functions. And language, these people still become proficient users of sign. So it's not that they don't learn to sign. It's just that they recruit other regions or other parts of the brain to perform the task. Um, so now I'm going to go on to our third scenario, which is international adoptees. And this is, in contrast to the um, other situation, uh, this is not lack of development of a first language. This is what happens when you learn a first language in the first year of life, and then it's abruptly changed, and you learn a second first language. So here I'm going to be speaking about the work that I've been doing with Fred Genesee, and uh, our student, Lara Pierce, who's a doctoral student. And I called it Mapping the Unconscious Maintenance of a Lost First Language, which is maybe uh, preempting the results for you a little bit. But what we were interested to show was whether um, children um, show traces of their mother tongue, even though the language is discontinued. 
And this work follows on a little bit from studies that I'd done long ago in the 1990s where we did tone discrimination tasks with English and Chinese uh, individuals because we were interested to see how tone was processed in the brain. And in this study, so this is a study that we did a long time ago where we looked at adults and what we asked them to do was a tone discrimination task. So everybody can do this task. Everybody hears identical stimuli acoustically. So for example, there's a rising tone. I'm not even good at saying these, but pa and pa. Everybody can make that distinction. Do they sound the same or do they sound different? And you can all do the task as rapidly. But for native speakers of Chinese, these tone carry lexical meaning. So they can't differentiate, even though they can make the distinction without needing um, phonological information, they inadvertently ac activate lexical information because it's part of the stimulus. And this tonal information is learned within the first year of life because it's like learning the phonemes of a language, so you learn it really early. So we gave this to Chinese bilingual, to Chinese individuals and to English-speaking individuals. And what you can see is that the Mandarin group activate the left hemisphere in this task, and the English group activate the right hemisphere because the English group are processing these tones as non-linguistic sounds. And the Mandarin group are processing these as linguistically relevant to, to the language. So with Laura and Fred, we did a similar kind of a study. So we looked at international adoptees. These are people who learn Chinese from birth. They were adopted between 6 and 25 months of age. And basically, um, at the time of adoption, they started to speak only French. So these are individuals with discontinued use of Chinese. We had a control group who are individuals who are born in Montreal to Chinese parents who at the same age as the adoptees started learning French. So they're the case of continued exposure to Chinese with a second language as well. And then we have a monolingual group who are, have never been exposed to Chinese uh, who you would predict would process these stimuli non-linguistically. So we gave them a similar kind of a task so we actually didn't use real words here, we used non-words because we didn't know, not all the children were adopted from the same province. So in order to ensure that whether they spoke Cantonese or Mandarin, we had similar tones, we used non-words that in incorporated the tones from many different dialects, but that which were tonal and carried linguistic meaning. And what you can see, so the bilinguals activate in this bottom section you can see the left hemisphere. So they activate both hemispheres, but the left way more strongly than the right. The monolinguals activate only the right hemisphere doing this task. And quite surprisingly, the international adoptees look incredibly like the bilinguals, even though they have no conscious recollection of tone. So these are individuals that are currently monolingual French speakers, haven't heard Chinese since possibly six months of age, and yet they still activate these regions, showing that these templates that are set up really within the first year of life have a lasting impact even into adolescence. And in this conjunction analysis that we did, so you see the overlap between the bilinguals and the international adoptees, you see really strikingly similar patterns between the two groups. And what was even more intriguing is if you regress in, so you take the whole group of adoptees and you look at their um, a whole brain analysis of the regions that correlate with age of uh, adoption, you see that the um, more time, so this is kind of a complex thing, the longer they were in, uh, exposed to Chinese, so the later they were adopted, the more likely were to see activity in the left planum temporale, so in the left hemisphere in response to this tonal discrimination task, suggesting that this early exposure to Mandarin or, or, or to Chinese uh, is impacting or, or linked uh, with their linguistic relevance uh, to, to, to these individuals. So this is really quite striking and we think it sort of t speaks to, you know, I put up those slides about critical or optimal periods for language development and everybody floats around optimal periods all the way to adolescence, but really um, 
I think that, especially for phonology, so I think when we talk about critical periods, they're critical periods for different aspects of language processing. Um, there is a, a study which had looked at this question before, Christophe Pallier, and he hadn't found a distinction between Koreans uh, and French speakers, but he had used a, a, a different kind of a task which wasn't tapping what might have been learnt within that first year of life. Uh, using tonal distinctions, which is something that they are exposed to in that first year of life, we were able to tease that apart. So the, the second part of the work that we've been doing is to look at what happens to their second language or their first language at this point. Now, none of this is published, uh, and my student, Lara, gave me permission to present it today. So it's, it's, it's kind of, I suppose it's, it's, it's work that... Um, uh, we hope will come out soon. And this is to see whether the delay um, of that first year leads to changes in the mechanism underlying. Here we call it L2 processing, but it actually could be thought of as L1 processing. So what are the persistent effects of the birth language on later organization? And what you see here is again, uh, so this is actually, let me explain the task to you. They're doing a phonological working memory task here. And phonological working memory is something that depends on um, the knowledge of the sounds of the language that you learn much earlier in life. And phonological working memory has been correlated with uh, good and poor performance. And phonological working memory has been correlated with uh, better reading performance. And so in this task, what they do is they do a zero, one back, and two back phonological working memory task. So here what they're doing is they're listening to actually nonsense French stimuli, and they have to say, um, they have to press a button whether it occurred one back, two back, uh, zero back, one back, or two back. And what you see is the monolingual group, so the French only group, activate, this is against the silent baseline, they activate the left insula so we're doing this task. Michael Chi, whose task we based it on, activated very similar regions for this phonological working memory. And the insula is meant to sort of be a marker of language attainment. The bilingual group activate bilateral superior temporal regions, and strikingly, the adoptive group activates similar regions too. Now, what's kind of interesting is that you would expect all of these people who've all been exposed, well, the, it's certainly the bilinguals have been exposed. Um, well, I suppose the bilinguals and adoptees are both kind of uh, L2 speakers of this language, whereas the monolinguals are L1 speakers. But they're all a high proficiency, and they all do really well at this task, but they show different patterns of activation. When you do a subtraction of the bilinguals from the monolinguals, the area that's different is the left insula. When you do a subtraction from the adoptees to the monolinguals, again, the left insula is the area that comes out as being different between these two groups. Um, but what's interesting is that she also looked at um, not just against the baseline, but what the effect of cognitive load is. So the two back minus the zero back. So the monolingual French activate the insula, but they don't activate other regions. The L2 learners, so these are the uh, Chinese French bilinguals, don't activate the insula, they activate temporal regions, and a whole read, uh, uh, sort of regions involved in sort of cognitive load. And the same for the international adoptees, no insular activation, and again, similar recruitment uh, in, when we look at the effect of cognitive load um, to the, the Chinese speaker. So both of these groups uh, are showing similar patterns, again, not just in the first language, but in the second. So all groups perform similarly on accuracy and reaction time. Only the monolinguals show the left insular activation, which Michael Cheese called a marker of linguistic attainment. Monolinguals show no effect of the increasing phonological working memory load, but the L2 learners and the IA show activity associated with a more additional processing. And the different patterns for both the bilingual and the IA groups who are exposed to French prior to age three, suggest that even these very short delays in language acquisition lead to differences in the patterns observed for phonological working memory. So again, even the influence on other aspects of language processing is being influenced by patterns or language learning experiences that are happening really, really early in life. 
So now I'm just going to take my talk into a slightly different zone, and I'm going to talk about knowledge translation, because I know that uh, your group are really interested in that. And I also thought it would be quite interesting for the students, because I think that uh, we all sort of think that we have to go out and do work that is really meaningful. But sometimes the most meaningful work comes from basic science research or from work that we do that we don't actually intend to have an application. Um, and I sort of thought I'd start with where my work has had an application and then move into something as, as another thought. Um, because when I started doing these studies, especially the PET scans that I did on these bilingual subjects long ago in the 1990s, I really had, uh, I felt quite guilty about asking people to get into a PET scanner and do quite an evasive task. And I wasn't sure, luckily I'm left-handed, so I didn't have the option of being chosen for one of these studies. But I always wondered whether I would have volunteered for one of these studies, and I felt a little guilty about doing the scan, just to find out whether the same brain regions are involved for first and second language acquisition. But I presented, because I'm in a neurological institute, at one of the student presentation seminars, I presented my data, and I showed that slide of the strikingly left lateralized activity that I put up at the beginning of this talk, and the surgeon's eyes sort of dropped out of there heads and they thought, oh, you, we can start sending you all our patients and instead of sending them for invasive tests, which there, there were at the time for lateralizing language, you can just give them this relatively non-invasive test and not only that, you can lateralize within a hemisphere. So since then, I run the pre-surgical brain mapping unit at the Neuro and have scanned over a thousand patients with brain tumors and brain lesions that probably wouldn't have had operations because their lesions were in inoperable brain regions. And so some of the knowledge that we have can be used for things even as varied or as distant that we think they have a, a, a relevance for because we study language, and language is such an important part of, of human existence that it actually filters into many facets of life. So as an example, this is a patient with a brain tumor, and you can see that I was asked to activate the anterior speech region and show the surgeon the proximity to the lesion. And this is a student that had what was thought to be inoperable and she went in to have the operation while she was awake during surgery to verify that language was in fact close to there. Imaging is not perfect. As I've mentioned to people today, there's a lot of brain shift as you start to open the brain to an operation. So you have to account with models for brain shift during operations. Um, but it provides some kind of a guide, uh, at least for the patient, of knowing what kind of risk they might have uh, post-operatively. So that's kind of one example. This is another of a type of vascular lesion. Also being able to show how things might shift. There's individual variability that we can look at also in subjects. But also knowing some things, like in this patient with epilepsy who was trilingual, that all that you know, language is represented in a similar way for all three languages is uh, important for some. She was uh, actually an interpreter and uh, she wanted to ensure that her uh, livelihood wouldn't be affected as a result of having uh, an elective surgery for relief of epilepsy. And so knowing something that we did and being able to have these tasks in all the different languages was important. But not only that, knowing about translation is important and it probably would be the same in the States, but we have many patients who don't speak either English or French. Um, so here we had a patient who spoke Inuktitut. So we gave her the stimuli in English. We knew that she could produce the responses to us in Inuktitut. We mapped her brain region. She has an arteriovenous malformation. We mapped the activity to the uh, proximity of the lesion, and then they did a clipping of the lesion. And in that way, we were able to uh, assist in them developing a, a method for her surgical resection. So this brings me to the question of knowledge translation in the field of educational neuroscience, which I think is a wonderful idea. And I think really the time is right for this kind of field. I think it wasn't right all the time, but it's really becoming the right time for it. Because I think, firstly, it's been quite difficult to bridge the worlds of development and adulthood until now. And I think now we kind of have a, a, um, tools that can be used that speak to each other, um, that work across these different domains. And also because I think that um, 
the types of things we could do with imaging were not that sophisticated when we first started out. But we're becoming more able to use sophisticated experimental designs to ask questions that might actually address some things which could have an impact um, on teaching strategies or ways about thinking about education or about optimal periods for doing uh, different types of interventions. And so um, I think that the work that we've been doing, although I never set out to have translation into educational neuroscience, I think that having a lifetime of kind of looking at these questions and starting to realize the importance of optimal periods, starting to realize that they might be really way earlier than the, is put out there in the field, uh, starting to understand the com complex sort of interactions between many sort of aspects of, of experience, um, makes me realize that maybe some of our work one day might be also important for long-term uh, implementation of uh, um, differences in, in, in translation. And I think, you know, so you have beautiful tools for F, I'm not sure how to pronounce it, F -nears. Um I know nothing about that method, but I think it's a perfect method for studying um, people with cochlear implants and all sorts of things where you can't use these kinds of tools that we've got but also because of the beautiful things you've discussed about how you can look at uh, interactions between two speakers. Um, so I think that uh, looks really promising. So I can't speak to FNIRS. I think it is an, an interesting tool. But even within the field that I'm working, voxel-based morphometry, resting state fMRI, cortical thickness, diffusion tensor imaging, functional scans, I think we have to not just rely on the methodology, but we have to ask the interesting questions and design interesting experimental paradigms to get a window into how we think the brain might work. And I think that focusing from the infant through to adulthood and to looking at how the brain might change over the course of this time is really uh, going to be really uh, important for, for advancing the field. And... Um, my, my final sort of thoughts are that I was born in South Africa where there are 11 official languages. Uh, I've always studied languages because it sort of was all around me and I was always interested in uh, how reading was affected by the structures of different languages, how to develop tests. In South Africa there were a lot of questions about learning a, um, you know, one language, learning to read in one language when you actually spoke a different language. Um, but I think that we all exist in worlds where there are really interesting linguistic populations. And what I tried to show in the three groups of speakers that I presented today is that these are very natural language laboratories uh, in which to obtain really critical pieces of information about how our brains might be shaped by experience. And um, so uh, I, see, I see us all as being able to contribute uh, to, to, to this field in, in a strong way just by taking advantage of the people that are around us and asking uh, the most interesting questions. So, I don't know if there are any questions or... Thank you so much. We're now opening the floor for questions, if anyone would like to ask a question. And for your questions, please come up to the stage to ask them. Well, I have a question then. Specifically, this question is about internationally adopted individuals. Those who are adopted have both the exposure of Chinese, say up until the age of six months, and then they drop that language and focus exclusively on French. So they still retain that information about the phonology of their first language. I wonder if later on in life they decide to go back and learn Chinese, would they be able to take advantage of that region that is still present in their learning of, lang of uh, Mandarin later? Well, I think this is the prediction, right? And maybe, 
it's sort of evolutionary kind of useful, right? So this is the question of whether uh, things that we learn in life, whether they're overwritten or whether these traces are left in the brain to take up at later points in time. And I suspect because I think that the brain is really um, very uh, rigid in its way of organisation, or I, I'm not using the right word, but it, it uses things in a very careful way. I think if it's left in the brain, it's there to be used in the brain at a later stage. Um, so the one question is what you ask, whether they would just learn tonal languages. The other question is whether they'd be better at learning any languages. So this is the question that we'll still have to ask. Um, but I think first question would be um, whether they have a, a more rapid or more successful way of learning tonal languages. We'd have to ensure that motivation is the same across all the groups when they learn it. A, 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 a person who wants to regain their roots might be more motivated to learn a language than somebody who might not. So we'd have to ensure that there's equal motivation in learning as well um, when it comes to, to, to doing that kind of study. Thank you. Okay, so to follow up on Paul's question, I think we both were interested in the same population here in terms of our question. So if we, you, you mentioned that we have a natural lab occurring all around us for our investigation, and that is, that is certainly true. Now with the internationally adopted population, you said at six months uh, they were adopted. Uh, or up to say six months to 12 months during that period, uh, that is an, a period for strong attention and energy on uh, phonological acquisition. So when we see a younger child who's exposed beyond that age, let's say that the internationally adopted person is, well, let me think of a scenario wherein they have exposure to one language up until age one, and then the other language until, say, age two. So from one to two, they have this other language, and then a third language beyond age two. So we know that very young children uh, are, can definitely become native speakers of a language with no problem, so long as they already have proficiency in the first language, the second, third, fourth become uh, even easier. And so uh, that so as long as they start by age two, that doesn't seem to be a problem. But my question, sorry for belaboring, I've been going a long way around to it, but my question is specifically with younger children, when they begin to acquire their phonological system from age one to two, and then later switch to another language, will we see the same kind of penetration that we see in the zero to one group? You see what I mean? With, like, for example, the Chinese tonal representation, that is in a more linguistic area. But with the one to two area, you know, when that language stops and then we begin the third, et cetera, what, you know, with the knowledge preservation, will we see that too, even if this has happened after that time and in a, a less sensitive period? as compared to the zero to one group? Well, I'm wondering how many times that will actually happen unless there are other sort of things going on that might... <coughs> so in adoption, if that happened, it would be because there might be behavioral problems or something that is also sort of causing the person because otherwise they sort of get adopted into a home and they would tend to be loved there and stay there and uh, be sort of given lots of exposure to the language. So I'm wondering how many natural language environments that would happen in. But um, theoretically, my thought is um, that probably it wouldn't be the same because I really think that this first year of life is really important for setting... So the, this phonological working memory, I think, builds on and a lot of language skills build on what happens really early in life. And we, we do know from the sign language work with Rachel that those people, well, I suppose you're, you're talking about having learnt one, you're, learn, you're talking about learning one phonetic system and then a separate phonetic system. Um, 
right? So it's not exactly the same thing. But I think that I think that constant. I think that learning two languages from birth, or learning, um, you know, might enhance your ability to then learn other languages in the next sort of phase of life or something. Because they say that you develop a kind of a broader phonetic repertoire. But I think that. Uh, just learning one and then changing to another might not necessarily, may, may not ha have, obviously within that phase of life you can still learn things. But I don't know of any experiment that's actually looked at that. Do you know of anything? No. I'm not sure I can answer that question. Well, I wish I could stay after this. I actually have a flight to catch right after this presentation. But I could ask you many questions. But the next one I'm going to ask is probably somewhat difficult to answer. So Chinese speakers of English can that uh, speak and hear can recognize tone and tonal differences with uh, Ease, but the representation is the key difference here. So what I'm wondering is, in your findings, do you think that these findings uh, specifically only apply to tone, or would it be also seen if we were looking at something else that uh, you wouldn't see that observed uh, sensitivity uh, later? So, for example, the difference between a P and a PH sound and uh, the distinction between those two. To an English listener, they really can't hear the difference between the two. Now, in tone, you can hear the difference specifically. You know, in, in Chinese, if you see what what I mean. So I understand your question. So is it specific to the Chinese population, or is this a, a generalized finding? And I think that I mean, this was an, a, a way of getting at it because it's it's easy to test. But I think it's universal. Uh, so I think that. Um, uh, you know, children very early in life, you know, in this idea, you know, which is uh, uh, the work of Patricia Kuhl and uh, Worker and all these people about the idea that in the beginning children are citizens of the world and that they start pruning and that this pruning starts taking place within the first three months of life. And these phonological distinctions and these things are, are really in the same time frame. So I think it's just that it might be harder to test because it's less easy to look. But you could probably find tones in Swedish or something like that. It's, the reason we use China is because there actually happens, because of China's one-child policy, to be a lot of adoptees from China who come to Canada. And we have a big population of adopted children in China to French parents. So it's sort of an easy population to study. And they don't spend a lot of time in the orphanages. And they actually um, are exposed to quite a lot of language in the orphanages. So they're an easy group to sort of test without extraneous variables. Um, but I think if you had to find a way of testing it, you could probably ask it for any language. And I would hope that it extends beyond just, uh, uh, Mandarin, uh, just Chinese tones. So there's nothing special then about the fact that everyone can hear the tone. That might be a contributing uh, factor to its preservation. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm just saying that this is a way of testing it because there, they are uh, identical acoustic stimuli. So everybody can do it. So it's not a question of differences in performance. Um, you can, we can all do it, but. If we process it non-linguistically, we uh, so it's a way of showing how people activate different parts of their brain. But I don't think that the tones in and of themselves, I think that what we're trying to show is the templates that are set up really early in development have a lasting impact into adulthood, and that this is just one way of showing that. Does that answer the question? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Give the floor to others now. <laughs> all the students had lots of interesting questions over lunch, so, so maybe they've asked them all. <laughs> OK. I'm trying to think about how I want to pose my question. <laughs> 
So I've thought about the subtractive bilingual in, uh, in the educational policy. So if we have children who are speaking a particular language at home and then enter the school system and begin to drop or at least uh, reduce the use of the home language, we see very often times that they will struggle with the second language development with uh, reading, etc. But I'm wondering, do we have a critical period for dropping that first language? So if it's a, is it six months to 24 months? During that span, is that the time wherein we see the similar regions in the brain that are uh, later impacted and uh, like uh, lesser acquisition of the first language or reacquisition of it uh, as compared to the L2. Does that make sense? So if I understand you correctly, you're, you're asking whether um, when you, um, so say somebody who comes here, say who's speaking Spanish, right, and then they become second first language um, English speaker. So you're asking, is there a point at which it's less optimal for them to drop the language? Um, right. So um, let me just think this through. So, so in my mind, you know, um, th what this study that we were doing is not really talking about optimal periods so much in terms of dropping or taking on a language, what we're showing is that the brain um, sh uh, activates different regions depending on um, the age at which you acquire these pieces of information. So in the two studies that I showed with the adoptees, we're showing um, maintenance of something that you learn really within the first elements of your life and not losing that. And we're showing persistent sort of effects. So if you learn a second language, even within that first year of life, you're still not going to process the information in exactly the same way. I don't think that study is really speaking to optimal versus less optimal performance because all of these people become um, very high proficiency users of the language. There might be some disadvantages in learning to read. So as an example, Spanish is a very regular orthography. And then people go into, so this is some of the things we were facing in South Africa. So it might be to do with the fact that you may not necessarily need to learn. Um, so I'm, this is getting a bit out of my depth because it's a long time since I worked on reading. But when I was working on reading, right, you can, you can learn to read by phonological roots and you can learn to read by direct reading and uh, for successful reading, for, certainly in the English language, you need to be proficient in the use of both those things. And we sort of saw in the work that we were doing in South Africa where they're very regular orthographies that learning to read English became quite difficult because lots of children never really, if your language doesn't require you to use um, uh, both roots necessarily, you may not never really learn it. And if there are SES sort of issues related to this, this might also not be enhanced and those kind of things. So it might just be that for certain types of cognitive processing, they just haven't learnt or their language that they used, the cross-language interaction might be having some impact. Now, I mean, maybe that's not your question, but to me that's one element of it. And even with critical periods, I think what our work's kind of speaking to a little bit is that there isn't really one critical period. There are... Um, you know, so learning, like a lot of our work in the early stages, really shows that the patterns look really quite similar across uh, different individuals for lexical search and retrieval, for acquiring vocabularies. And all human beings can build up quite big vocabularies. But grammar might be impacted in specific ways, and uh, d definitely articulation seems to be impacted. And, uh, you know, phonology is, I think, impacted really radically in that early phase. Um, and then, the, you know, aptitude might play into it, and there may, may be many individual factors. So it's sort of difficult to tell, but obviously um, changes to something that somebody's become, um, there must be many aspects of language which become more automatic 
and then when you have to learn it a second way in possibly a less automated kind of way, there must be some advantages to learning things in a, you know, when we're children, we don't learn things the same way as when we learn things um, as we get older. And obviously being, uh, you know, like a lot of people have emphasized, including Laura, motheries and those kind of things. And obviously when you learn those things very young, then you're going to sort of develop a certain kind of, they say motheries is kind of the, 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 um, the forerunner of kind of being exposed to the linguistic elements. So, I mean, this is really not my domain, but I think that, you know, many of these things, when you're learning one language and then you change it, but later, you might be learning it in a slightly different capacity and it might make it more difficult to acquire in the same way. But probably, I mean, you know, children, when they have strokes, right, the, the, uh, there can be a lot of recovery of capacity until about the age of five. So certainly some of these general ideas about critical periods probably still hold that there is kind of a period within the first three or four years of life where there's more plasticity and then, you know, between the ages of... The, probably these critical periods didn't come out of, you know, the air for nothing. They do relate in some way to potential for, the, for change over time. Um, but then within that, I still think that there are more optimal periods than others. Thank you. Well, I'm thinking about the connections here. So we were talking about international adoptions, but also looking at, you know, the uh, natural sort of uh, language laboratories uh, that are around us here. So it occurs to me that it's quite interesting that a Chinese baby will still have some traces left in the brain of the first language, regardless of the fact that they stopped learning that after, say, one or two. But I think we've got another similar thing here with baby sign. So I know baby sign is a very you know, hot topic and somewhat controversial because they're not necessarily linguistic, uh, linguistic in nature. The baby's parents are learning maybe 20 signs, but the babies do use it. And then the parents drop it after, say, age one when the babies start to speak. And so it's this very temporary communication tool as opposed to a, a full language. But I'm thinking about the fact that there are so many hearing children who were exposed to baby sign when they were little and they never use sign again ever after. So uh, I'm interested in the question of how good the phonological input must be to sort of penetrate the brain in this way. So uh, baby sign is not a language. It doesn't have syntax. It doesn't have all of that, but it does have some phonology. So. Uh, if we're testing adults who learned baby sign as babies and then see if they still show activation for signing, I wonder if that means that that was sufficient phonological input. And if it doesn't show activation there, then it means, yeah, you really need a full language, not a little bit of phonology, a few, you know, some signs that that won't do the trick. It sounds like another natural language lab uh, experiment right there. Well, I think it's interesting. I don't know how intensive, uh, you know, so I suppose it's a question. These babies who are born in China, right, this is their mother tongue every day of their lives for the first six months. So I, I don't know in the um, baby sign um, how intensive it is and in what context they learn it. Um, I think there might be more natural laboratories just within your own world. Um, that could be interesting. Like, I don't know if people start to learn to sign and then when they get cochlear implants, they stop signing. And then if you looked at them, you know, 10 years down the line, what would their signing abilities be like? I don't know, maybe that might be a, a better way of getting at because then you would be getting at what was really, you know, uh, and you could look at varied ages and whether, you know, so I don't know, because that seems to me more of a naturalistic language learning environment. But I'm not sure, because I don't know much about the signing that happens with babies, to, uh, you know, during uh, their first years of life in, in hearing environments, whether that's sufficient. It would be very interesting then to see how resilient the uh, 
uh, the baby is to these different levels of linguistic input? I mean, maybe, maybe the point is to change the emphasis about sign language in these early things to uh, maybe it's being lost. I mean, I, I don't know a lot about the baby sign and I don't really want to go into that world because it's not my domain, but uh, it could be that the sorts of things that people are teaching their babies to sign during that first year might not be what's necessary for developing a, a, a language base. So maybe that could be the experiment, what would be a more optimal way of teaching sign to, to leave lasting traces that might link to something uh, more permanent. Thank you. visual sign phenology and um, so say it to say to flip this the um, young deaf children form from the visual world around them extract out and are sensitive to the same level of phonological analysis that they're sensitive to in spoken language so a young baby is sensitive to the rhythmic undulating patterns of speech and pull out the phonological segments and look for the distribution of the segments, et cetera, to form a phonology that they then use as they're getting older when they learn to read. This is one of the ways in which they crack into reading through the decoding process. Well, it turns out that when a young deaf child is exposed to sign language early in life, they too extract out the same rhythmic undulating segments of the hands and set up a visual sign phonology so that when they learn to read, they crack into the letters on the page by mapping to visual segments of the phonological visual units onto the page en route to meaning. So the, the, when you withhold the language from a child early in life, we too in our own research see dramatic changes to the brain, that the child is losing that information and that the brain changes as a result if you don't get that. So what we're seeing in your work is a wonderful support coming from these other languages, from French, from Chinese, that early exposure to sign language, early exposure to language is critical. And I'm just offering that the types of information that a child pulls out of language early in life is, is dramatically the same across modalities. Yeah. And the impact on the brain we're seeing is also the same. Your, your work on the early exposed simultaneous bilinguals versus the later exposed bilinguals is very dramatic. The brains are quite different. Right. Yeah. And so um, from this other perspective, it really supports the need for early exposure to language. 
and I think Rachel's work too, where she looks at the congenital sign language, um, those individuals who learn sign from birth learn to read, they learn to speak second languages, uh, because all of these other skills depend on a fully formed uh, system in order to acquire these other skills. And those who learn sign language later are the ones who have difficulty learning to read and have difficulty learning second languages. So learning a second language is strongly dependent on uh, learning a first. Yeah. With that, uh, I will uh, thank you very much for your presentation. We were delighted to have you here and to uh, be one of our distinguished lecture series presenters. We thank you very kindly. And with that, we will close. Well, thanks very much.